pupil of Arnold School and as such an old Arnoldian and uh, very happy to have been invited to speak to you as part of this week-long series of webinars and videos all relating to International Women's Day. Um, to give you a little bit of my background, I attended Arnold until about 2002, I think. Uh, I went off to Manchester University and studied engineering material science, uh, but I also set out on a 17-year professional career playing rugby union. Um, I played for Sir Sharks, uh, Stade Francais Paris, and Northampton Saints. Um, I also, since then, have retired and have now moved on to be Head of Player Affairs at the Rugby Players Association in England. Um, and also, I've just completed an MBA in Sporting Leadership. Uh, so that gives you a bit of background as to what I've been up to. Um, as I say, I've, I've been asked today to speak in relation to International Women's Day, so less about me and more about uh, women. Um, I guess primarily it's worth saying that I actually work with the, the England women's team. I'm uh, Head of Player Affairs also for Team England Rugby and we've just taken on board uh, our women players so that they will be managed and looked after in exactly the same way as we have looked after the men's EPS team um, in previous years. It's quite a big step forward for us, uh, but something that I was really keen on doing, I thought it was important to do, and hopefully um, me talking for the next 10 minutes or so will tell you some of the reasons why. Um, women's Rugby Union is, is actually a pretty big success story, really. Have been world champions inside the last five or so years. Uh, if you look at things like viewing figures, um, in 2014 about 200,000 people watched that final. In 2018 around about 2 million people watched the next final that again England were part of. Unfortunately they didn't uh, lift the trophy. Uh, as I say we, we now represent the women's EPS players in exactly the same way as we represent the men. Uh, the game turned professional in round about 2011, but not, you know, not to the extent it is now, where there are currently more than 30 full-time contracted professional women's players in England, and that number will increase in years to come. So, so women's sport, women's rugby, you know, a success story, and yet I do feel like we could probably discuss um, why sport is so important and, and where perhaps sport can get a little bit better, particularly in terms of women's sport. So if I talk to you first about simply a topic that, that I think is really important is the power of sport. So it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, any, um, you know, any way you wish to define yourself, sport is something that's seen as being really important. The IOC, uh, the International Committee of Sport, you know, that is their catchword, the power of sport. And why is that? So you've got to think about the effects that sport can have on people. It can have effects from all different levels and will affect the amount of funding that, that any organization or group will get. Sport can point to the fact that it has hugely positive impacts on societal issues, health issues. Uh, indeed, as, as pupils of a school, education, you know, in, in America where sport is a huge part of the collegiate system, they, there's been numerous studies which highlight that, um, that taking part in sport actually leads to better grades. Um, if we think of the financial impact of sport and the amount of investment it produces in this country, uh, and we can also talk about something that I'm really interested in, which is sporting leadership and how it relates to kind of everyday leadership and, and how many sporting leaders we now find in, in big business, in government and, and all, all throughout society. I'd also like to speak about something which, which probably gets a bad rap from time to time, and that's equality. Um, equality is something which I hugely believe in it's something which I I guess you either have a passion for or you don't but you can look at equality from from a whole different range of viewpoints you can look at equality as everything has to be 50 50 down the middle um, you can look at that that it should be enforced uh, immediately which in terms of sport it isn't realistic given the head start that men's sport has got and, um, and again I'm going to come on to that later um, you could look at equality in terms of some of the diversity and inclusion groups that are now set up, which are aimed at readdressing that balance and indeed, you know, actively recruiting in some roles 
uh, putting a, a positive look on, on things like women leaders and, and we need more women leaders throughout, um, throughout sport. Um, but for me, as someone who, who I want to be a leader in sport and, and having just sat an MBA in sporting leadership, the, the number one thing really is, is your integrity as a, as a leader. Um, if you cannot look people in the eye and, and do what you said you were going to do and stand up for what you believe in, can you ever truly lead a group of people? And, and for me, integrity is the number one uh, requirement for a good leader. Um, I actually wrote my uh, MBA dissertation on sporting leaders and above all when you when you speak to people they want people to lead them who they know can be trusted, who they know will do what they said they did. And, and so for me as someone working within professional sport, professional rugby union, we have to start readdressing the balance of the opportunities given to our women players. So let's come on to women's sport. Um, I'm going to make some statements and assumptions that you may not agree with, um, but I'm going to say them and I'm going to say them because this is where I think that the balance needs to be readdressed. So women's sport in this country is undervalued. Um, by saying that, I mean that the media has a big part to play in this, but um, women's sport does not get the exposure it deserves. It does not get promoted in the way it should be. And that is something that needs to be readdressed. Um, why is that of, of importance? Is because if there's no value given to professional women's sport, then there likely is no dream for some of our female children or young, young girls looking at women's sport and thinking that they want to be involved. So I bet if I, if I asked um, a load of 10 year old boys, you know, what do they want to be when they grow up? Invariably, some of those boys will answer Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo or other leading sportsmen. You know, a rugby player could be, for me, me growing up, people like Jason Robinson. You know, there has to be a dream there for a child to pursue. And at the moment with women's sport, I don't think that the dream exists enough to, to truly have a, a wide-ranging effect on society. If there's no, uh, if there's no dream, it means that there's no participation in the sport. So if children don't grow up wanting to be something or being or seeing role models ahead of them, seeing ways in which they can develop themselves, ultimately the participation levels won't get to where they should be. Now, why, why does that matter? If there's no participation in a the sport, then sports start to lose funding. And, and hence this vicious cycle then presents itself. That is, if there's no funding for a sport, from governmental level or any other level from, from the public, it means that that sport will start to lose any kind of traction whatsoever. If there's no traction for a sport, its value goes down. And hence we're back to the start of this cycle. Now, like I said, this is my personal opinion and I've got to say, I think rugby union, I think football, I think cricket are all doing great work in this area. But in terms of a wider um, viewpoint on this, I think that we, we all need to address the fact that women's sport has had decades of, of not being funded to the appropriate levels. Uh, young girls have not had, um, and boys for that matter, have not seen female role models in the sporting world and hence women's sport does not have the participation and the funding and the exposure that it should have. So in terms of um, what's required, we need um, we need funding more, more than anything else, uh, as, as most businesses, sports, uh, most people around the world at the moment. You know, funding is the key, and what, that is because if with the right funding you can create the right exposure. I actually think, as I said at the start, women's sport is undervalued. Um, if you think of rugby union in particular, all of the, or the majority of brands associated um, you know, commercially with rugby union are all masculine brands so as a as a businessman looking at the sport and ways in which you can expand your business you know branching out into women's sport is is pretty crucial because it's going to open up new opportunities with brands that are more more female associated and that's that's just a pure matter of business um the media have have a large part to play in this um, if we can get female sport and participation onto mainstream media and TV, written print, 
the radio, uh, YouTube, every, you know, all media outlets, the more the public see women's sport, the more that they will become uh, interested in it, they want to take part, and hence we start to get that dream. Now, if you think of um, you know, what COVID has just showed us in the last year, that you have to have a passion for sport to want to continue watching it. And there's countless numbers of people sat at home who are still watching their, their favorite team on TV, but they can't go to the stadium to watch. And that's something where, you know, in order to build this, this drive for, for women's sports, we have to start making people feel that, that affiliation with their club. And that's where actually some of these, some of the drive in, in Premiership Rugby, for instance, that the men's teams now have um, an affiliated women's team can be really helpful. We want passionate people involved in the sport to drive this forward. People shouldn't feel compelled to to watch women's rugby because they like rugby. They should they should feel compelled to watch it because the rugby is good and they feel a, they feel passionate towards it. So that's um, a starting point there. And, and with that exposure, we have to make sure that the exposure is of the right kind. So in years gone by, and thankfully this has kind of been moved onward from, but if you look at the type of coverage that female athletes have been given, um, you know, from my, my childhood, athletes like Anna Kornikova was, was constantly sexualized and, and shown in a, in a light where her glamour and her looks were more important than actually her, her physical ability. And that's something which, you know, some of the female athletes that we've had in recent years, like Serena Williams being a prime example of someone who, whose performance on the court is, is truly incredible. She's broken down boundaries and she's stood up for herself and her sport and women in general and said, you know, my achievements on the court stand alone and, and I don't need anyone to promote me in, in any way other than for those things. Um, hopefully, I haven't rambled too much. I've gone past my 10 minutes. I understand that I will be sent some questions which I can answer, so hopefully I can uh, provide some answers to those. Like I said, all, all these uh, are my own opinions. They're not the opinions of my workplace or, or you know, they're generalizations more than anything, but I just, I feel really passionate in this area. As I say, I work with uh, 30 incredible professionals who make up the Red Roses uh, England rugby team and I see the work they put in, I see the drive and determination they have, and I just want them to be given um, a fair shot at what they absolutely deserve. Hello, and thank you for having me back. And I now have some questions from you, which is, uh, which is excellent. And I look forward to answering these. I think the, the important word here is young people. I think there's challenges at all different age groups and all different people. And the challenges that I potentially face in sports administration are very different to the challenges that a younger person should, should attempt to challenge. That said, the, the end goal is the same. And if, and if we refer back to the, um, kind of the, the feedback chart that I mentioned earlier in terms of exposure and participation and funding and that cycle um, young people have a really important role to play in that and that's to start viewing some of these incredible people these incredible sports people as as aspirations and something you would like to be when you grow up and then it's all about taking part in those sports if um, you know you're never going to reach that goal unless you take part unless you try and excel and, and in doing that in loving a sport and taking part in a sport you're only going to encourage other people to take part participation goes up more funding comes in more people have that dream and uh, and women's sport should grow and, and we'll build towards that equality that everyone wants and needs rugby is um, a very physical sport and professional men's rugby is an incredibly physical sport probably one of the most physical sports in the world and I guess that makes the easy um, the easy thing to say about women taking part in rugby is that why would um, why would women want to do that I think modern day women would challenge that um, that notion instantly and actually rugby itself should challenge that notion given that rugby is marketed and I believe it's one of the RFU's key um, key factors is that rugby is a sport for everyone and that's what makes rugby amazing because in football you'll have 11 guys or girls who are 
more or less the same size, shape, speed. In cricket, you'll find that most most athletes are the same size. In you know most sports is is a uniform size, and rugby is one that differentiates. So there's a place in rugby for for short people, for fast people, for strong people, for tall people, all different skill sets. And as such, it offers a, a wide variety of, of opportunities to get involved in the sport and love the sport. So, yes, rugby probably is on the surface seen as a tough physical sport that women wouldn't have previously wanted to be involved with. But I think that that notion is gone now. Rugby in, in England, I think this year was the first time that uh, women players outstripped men players. Um, England is, is the biggest rugby market in the world. And... And it's um, you know the sport is growing rapidly with female participation, so I think the notion that rugby's for men is is well and truly dismissed in the modern game. It depends who you're comparing those girls to. Uh, I can tell you that there are uh, plenty of female Olympic lifters who are much, much, much stronger than I am. And I am a big, strong ex-professional athlete. So uh, saying that someone isn't strong enough or fast enough, who are you comparing those people to? Um, if it's talking about women playing against women in a woman's sport, then some of the athletes in the England women's team at the moment are absolutely incredible, would, would outstrip me in fitness testing every day of the week. So strength can mean many different things uh, it can mean mental aspects it can may, mean skill aspects um, there's a lot more to being good at rugby than, than um, your bench press or your squat score so yes you may be stronger than a, a woman athlete but she will probably be far excelling you in other areas and I'm speaking to the men on this call when I say that um, but uh, the world's about diversity isn't it everyone in the world has different skill sets different passions and you should never say i'm not going to watch something because that skill set doesn't match my skill set or, or similar to that the whole point is there should be something for everyone to enjoy watching and taking part in um i now work with the england women's rugby team so i'm gonna get a, a lot of stick if i don't choose one of them um, God, there's loads. I think rather than going for like the the obvious ones, so girls like Emily Scarrett um, was just made World Rugby Player of the Year. Um, incredible player, uh, dual international in fifteens and sevens. She is, you know, when I just spoke about being an athlete. She is a proper athlete, um, fast, strong, skillful, uh, and a thoroughly nice person and now commentates on the men's game as well and shows her knowledge of the game so she is kind of your your modern day example of a, of a proper amazing female rugby player um also in that group but in the sevens group is a, a girl called heather fisher um, she appeared on sas are you tough enough um, again physically an incredible athlete but beyond that off the field she um, she hosts her own radio station in London. Um, she she has her own kind of uh, drive for equality. Um, she's not, not been outspoken, but more speaks incredibly well about it and, and just encourages people to take part in rugby and, and not be afraid of, of doing that as a, as a female. So there's two names for you if, you, if you're not aware of, to look them up. Um, in my previous talk, I mentioned Serena Williams, who you know, she's probably the greatest of all time in tennis. Um, and then growing up, I was a massive golfer, and, and you are lucky to have Royal Lytham on your doorstep. You know, when the Women's Open comes, there's so many incredible um, British golfers, the likes of Charlie Hull at the moment, but also when I was growing up, um, Annika Sorenstam was a, a female golfer that I looked up to. She was kind of the powerhouse at the time. So, yeah, loads. So the first question I said, um, you know, different people have different challenges here. My challenge being a, a sports administrator now is, is to basically challenge the, the old school mentality. Um, and not just that, also the, the commercial mentality. It, it's very easy to, to hide behind the fact that the men's game is, is financially much more powerful, it's much more marketable currently. Um, and that 
that is down to decades of funding and exposure and TV money and everything else which has grown the men's game exponentially whilst the women's game has waited. And I think now is the time for the women's game, rugby, football, cricket, every women's sport is growing probably now faster than the men's. So now is the time to lend support to the women's game and it's unfortunate to have to say, to say it but me as, a, as an ex-male professional rugby player carries more weight than than other people would and if I can say this game deserves more attention more support um, it deserves it, you know it deserves what it deserves um, that that's my challenge is, is to promote the game wherever and whenever I can and that's something that I am absolutely doing in my role with Team England Rugby and just just empowering the athletes themselves to to be what they can be they are a brilliant brilliant group to play with uh, to play with to work with um, they're always available they're always positive they're always willing to go the extra mile and that's that's what the sports needs uh, and that's what you know we go back to that first feedback loop you know we, we need young athletes to see them and aspire to be like them aspire to challenge them on the field and you know there are 18 to 21 year old girls now representing the England Roses and I hope some of the girls watching this video may aspire to too.